Here we're going to take a quick look at some facets of stabilization policy. As we think about stabilization policy, the goals would be a stable growth of real GDP, stable price level, so not significant inflation or deflation, and then a high level of, of employment or a low level of unemployment. I really like the way your textbook lays out the information in this section. So if you haven't read the chapter yet, go ahead and do that first before you watch the rest of this video. In the 1960s, economists noticed a uh, relationship between inflation and unemployment in the short run. Uh, you know, the problems of the Fed, may, the dual mandate of the Fed um, is to control inflation, stable prices, and to maintain high levels of employment or low unemployment. So this relationship that economists noted in the 60s was that higher levels of inflation was associated with lower levels of unemployment or vice versa. So it seemed like there was this trade-off here between inflation and unemployment. And this relationship we see in the Phillips curve, named after A.W. Phillips, who saw this relationship. So this is just the short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So inflation over here, employment over here. Unemployment, that is. We can derive this Phillips curve using our aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. So let's say we have uh, a small increase in aggregate demand, say from um, some kind of monetary stimulus perhaps, any, any of our shifters. Um, so that would be going from A to B, that would be a small increase in aggregate demand. And then we're also going to plot a large increase. So we can go from A to B or we could go from A to C. So our Phillips curve here just traces out what would happen at point B, that corresponds to this B, or at point C depending on the relative shift of the uh, of the, the size of the shift of the aggregate demand curve. Remember in our ADAS model, as you move to the right on the x-axis, unemployment falls. As you move to the left, unemployment rises. So remember, if you have the long-run aggregate supply, imagine that that was here at B, for instance. Point C would be a boom, so that is lower unemployment. So remember, unemployment falls to the right and rises to the left. You see that here. Um, now going comparing point B and point C again. So point B is higher unemployment than point C because unemployment falls as you move to the right. And then in both of these, you see we are expecting higher inflation. Uh, so B would be higher than A and C would be higher than B. And that's what we see here. So it's just straight up translating this information here into this Phillips curve graph. So we noticed this relationship economists did in the 1960s. And then economists just ran with it. Uh, this the relationship seemed to hold up across countries, and so um, policymakers thought that this was like an airtight relationship, a structural relationship. So you could straight up base policy right off of this this seeming trade off in the short run. So that they would choose, a, they could basically choose a point on the curve. Um, we could either have high inflation or lower unemployment or vice versa, and we could just pick and choose and adapt our our monetary physical policy to get to exactly where we wanted to. It turned out, as you see in your, your textbook, that this is not the case. That downward sloping Phillips curve, that could only that only ever happened in the short run is where that relationship was noted. In the long run, just like we have with long run aggregate supply, we're going to have a long run um, Phillips curve that is vertical because um, in the long run, employment is determined by output. So remember, that's the things, just like with long run average supply, it's, it's capital, it's labor, it's natural resources, it's entrepreneurship. It's going to go and determine the um, quantity of goods and services that are produced. Same thing here for employment. So in the long run, we will expect no trade-off between inflation and employment. In the long run, employment just goes to its natural rate, which is maybe 5%. So when you draw your long run aggregate supply curve, you can also, that's why I was saying when you combine unemployment on that aggregate demand aggregate supply graph, your, your long run aggregate supply curve is also the natural rate of unemployment. So if this were our aggregate demand aggregate supply graph again, unemployment increases as you move to the right and decreases as you move to the left. Uh, here on this graph though, notice we're just plotting unemployment. So this is just normal zero increasing to the right. At this long run level, this natural rate of unemployment, there is no cyclical unemployment. So all this is here in the long run is structural and frictional unemployment, unrelated to, to inflation. 
So in the 1960s, like I said, economists saw in the data this trade-off between inflation, this negative relationship between inflation and unemployment. The whole reason that seemed to work, or the reason that that actually did not work because economists ignored was because economists ignored expectations. So that short-run trade-off appears to exist because workers and firms sometimes expect the inflation rate to be either higher or lower than it turns out to be. So as an example of this, let's say that Ford and UAW agree to a wage of $34.65 per hour in 2018. So everybody here is expecting the price level, they're expecting some inflation, they're expecting the price level to increase from 110 to 115.5, so they're expecting 5% inflation. So remember this wage here, we agree to wage contracts in nominal terms. So this is not adjusted for inflation. This is just straight up dollars, whatever, however much dollars actually happen to be worth in 2018, that's what this is. So the real wage, we're going to uh, account for inflation. So do the nominal wage divided by the price level times 100. So here is what the expected real wage is in 2018 based on an expectation of the price level here. The worker's real wage depends on actually what inflation turns out to be. So if inflation is lower than expected, we, they were, everybody was anticipating a 5% level of inflation. If inflation turns out to be 2%, that uh, nominal wage that they negotiated for, 34.65, is actually worth more. The real wage would be 30.88. If inflation is higher than anticipated, then the real wage would, of course, be lower. So if, if they're right on target, if expectations are right on target, the real wage is $30 like everybody expected, Ford hires the planned number of workers. Now, if inflation is lower, that means that workers are actually getting paid more in real terms, so the real wage is higher, and Ford now would hire fewer workers because it's in real terms, it's having to pay its workers more. If inflation is lower, if inflation is higher than expected, that means that the real wage is lower than expected because, like I said, inflation is higher. So that means Ford could afford to hire more workers. So there's a logic here, a story that you should be able to think through. So firms and workers have expectations about inflation. If, if inflation turns out to be more than anticipated, that means that the real wages in that contract are lower than anticipated. So that means workers are worse off. The firm is better off. So now the firm can, hire, can afford to hire more workers, and that means unemployment is going to fall. If actual inflation is less than, than anticipated, then the workers who agreed to that nominal wage, they're better off because they're getting paid more in real terms. The firm is worse off, and so they're going to hire fewer workers. So the unemployment rate rises. So here's a quote from Friedman. There's always a temporary trade-off between inflation and unemployment. There is no permanent trade-off. This would be our long-run Phillips curve. And what does, where does that trade-off come from? Not from inflation per se, but from unanticipated inflation. So it's that difference between actual and expected inflation. So how, do the, how would the short-run and long-run Phillips curves be related? This is a lot like what we did with our aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. You remember when to get back to the long-run equilibrium, the point where we were on the long-run aggregate supply curve after you know supply, aggregate supply, or aggregate demand, short-run aggregate supply or aggregate demand had shifted, there was an adjustment in expectations about the price level. That's what caused the short-run aggregate supply curve to shift to get us back to the long-run equilibrium. We see a very similar thing here uh, as the, our short-run Phillips curve will shift. It's it's the short-run Phillips curve is drawn for a a, a certain expectation about prices about inflation. So uh, in the 1960s, inflation was low. We noticed this trade-off. Policymakers tried to um, you know, make use of it to get to an, a specific spot on the short-run Phillips curve. And initially, firms and workers expected inflation to remain low. It had been at 1.5%, and so they said, okay, this is, this, is, this is our expectation. But then as policymakers tried to exploit this relationship, uh, it led to inflation. And then as that happened, we move up the Phillips curve here because of the inflation. But now workers and firms adjust their expectations about inflation. They, they were thinking, oh, it's going to be 1.5, just like it's been for a while, pretty stable. But then higher inflation, they say, oh, it's not 1.5 anymore. Something's going on. It's actually 4.5. So when that happens, workers start demanding 
um, higher wages because they've experienced inflation. And we get back to this position here on the long run Phillips curve. So it causes the, the adjustment in expectation of ex expectations about inflation causes the short run Phillips curve to shift. And so now we are here back on the long run Phillips curve. Now again in the long run with no trade off between inflation and unemployment. So each short run Phillips curve is drawn for a specific expectation about the price level. So that's what this illustrates. And we're going to, I mean, in any case, we're always going to end up on our long run Phillips curve, just like we ended up on long run aggregate supply as expectations about the price level adjust. So by the end of the 70s, economists recognized, hey, the short run trade off we were trying to exploit, this is not working. We can't, we can't buy a permanently lower unemployment rate through permanently higher inflation. It doesn't work because of shifting expectations. So if they, if they wanted to keep doing that, if we wanted permanently lower unemployment at the cost of higher uninflation, the Fed would have to continually keep increasing inflation each year. So that's, it would just be shifting up this, um, short run Phillips curve every year. Or if it wanted lower inflation, um, at the cost of a temporarily higher unemployment rate, then, you know, that would shift the curve down. But in either case, after expectations adjust, we're always going to end up here on the long run Phillips curve. So sometimes you'll see this thing called the non-accelerating inflation rate of employment. That's just another name for our, you know, natural rate of employment, the unemployment rate on our long run Phillips, long run Phillips curve. How long does it take us to get back to the long run Phillips curve? It depends on workers' expectations, workers and firms' expectations, and then also on inflation itself. So if there's low inflation, uh, firms and workers are going to be slow to adjust because it's low inflation isn't that big of a deal. People can more or less ignore it. If there's moderate but stable stable inflation, typically there will be quick adjustment because inflation is stable. It's easily incorporated into expectations. If inflation is high and unstable, it's quick adjustment again. But because now we sh we should probably be thinking about rational expectations. Um, so workers and firms are paying a lot of, a lot of attention to forecasting inflation, uh, to monetary policy. Um, so maybe rational expectations would be the appropriate idea here. So rational expectations, uh, your book makes a big distinction here. You definitely need to know this for your quiz, the implications of the various uh, of the two main assumptions or theories about expectations. We have rational expectations. So that is using all available information to think about, in this case, inflation. And we also could think about adaptive expectations. So adaptive expectations would just basically be like, what was inflation last period? That's what it's going to be this period. So uh, the, two, the two key assumptions or hypotheses about, about expectations, you're going to need to know both of those. Like I said, your, the book does a good job of laying those out, so be very comfortable with them. So if workers and firms have adaptive expe expectations, what would that look like? Um, so adaptive, like I said, we're just saying whatever it was, whatever inflation was last time, that's what it's going to be this time. So in this case, with adaptive expectations, expansionary monetary policy could increase employment. So we're, this, is, this is the story initially, right? We expect 1.5. There's a increase in um, aggregate demand. And so initially, we're going to get here to point B because we're, we're expecting 1.5. After our expectations adjust, that's when the short run, the, uh, short run Phillips curve shifts and we end up back at point C. If, fir if workers and firms have rational expectations though, as soon as the Fed announces their policy or as soon as the policy change happens, um, workers and firms immediately expect inflation or deflation, depending on whatever the policy was. So in this case, we never go to point B, expectations adjust immediately and we go straight to point C. So if, if firms and workers have rational expectations, there would be no short run Phillips curve. All we would have would be the long run Phillips curve. So for your quiz, you need to know all about adaptive and rational expectations, be able to apply that to say uh, Phillips curve and to our aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. Uh, know kind of the pluses and minuses, the benefits and trade-offs, um, the arguments, I guess, that activists and non-activists make when we think about policy, and also think about the, uh, the various policy lags as you think about active, active stabilization policy.